and honestly, this is a, a series of lessons in and of itself. Now, I'm not going to try to do that this morning. We're going to more give a summary and, and a brief synopsis of it. But what I want you to, to do, if you will, is, is to open with me to Psalm 19. I, I think if I could put it in just one set of verses, what the value of the Old Testament is uh, when it comes to you and me right now today, uh, then this is probably the text I would have anybody look at as a starting point. There are many that want to dismiss uh, the Old Testament. Uh, there are others who want to try to uh, elevate the Old Testament as still being a law uh, that we should follow today. And so really the, the, the range of questions regarding the Old Testament is quite broad. And yet, when we kind of just step back from it for a moment and see the whole picture, so to speak, I really don't think it should be that complicated. Uh, the Old Testament certainly, certainly has a place and a value. It had that at the time that it was written and used. It had that in the time of transition uh, to the New Testament. And it has it today. Uh, for you and for me, so many years later. But in Psalm 19, a psalm of David, I want you to notice what David wrote. We, we have a song, uh, I believe it's in these current hymnals. It's, I know, been through uh, in different hymnals through the years recently, used quite often, that is based on these words. But I want you to notice what David is saying about the Old Testament as we refer to it, the old law uh, of God. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. I want to stop there. I think just those verses, verses 7 through 11, give a wonderful summary in poetic form of what the Old Testament value is. Uh, to each of us. Now certainly David was writing in a time in which the old law was in place and it was to be uh, observed and followed by the Israelites, by the Jews. But I want you to notice that when you see the description that is given there and we sing the song as I mentioned even today that uses these very words, the message of those words I would submit holds true. And it holds true not only to the Old Testament but to all of the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is perfect. The Word of God converts the soul. The Word of God is sure, and it makes wise the simple. And so we could go through each of those verses, and we could say that the Word of God holds those characteristics. And to lessen the Old Testament, in a sense, is to uh, lessen the Word of God, or to fail to recognize that the Old Testament is the Word of God as well. It's as though we in some cases have shoved it aside and forgotten that it also is the Word of God. I want you to also notice that in the midst of this is some statements about the right or the wrong of man versus God's Word. Notice in verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right. You know, and, and, and that's... A revealing thing as well. Even though when we look at the Old Testament today, you and I might say, well, I'm glad that we don't have to keep the old law. Okay? But does that mean that the old law was wrong? No, not at all, right? But you see how it begins to get a negative connotation when we say, well, I'm glad I don't have to keep the old law. Well, but that doesn't mean that the old law was wrong. It was right. As a matter of fact, when you, oh, when you look through the, the gospel accounts and you see Jesus as he talks to the scribes and the Pharisees and the crowds, as he's teaching them parables and sayings and so forth, 
often he uses the old law, the old teaching, and he restates the old law, and then he just teaches further what the true heart of the matter is, what the real meaning of that is. And so when you go through the teachings of Jesus, in many cases, if not all cases, I guess you could really argue, he's not saying the old law was incomplete. He's not saying the old law was bad, or the old law was something short of what we needed. No, what he was pointing out ultimately is that we as people have not seen the full value of the old law. For instance, when Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Had they all heard that? Well, sure, that was part of the commandments. But what did he say? But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after has committed adultery in his heart. Well, I mean, was he establishing really a new law? No. Because the, the law didn't mean do everything you want to do except for actually commit the act of adultery. Is that what that meant? Is that what it meant? The old law meant do everything you want to do except for actually commit. You see, we know better than that. And to, to see that is to see the point that the old law of God, the Old Testament, is extremely valuable because through it, as we'll look at in a moment, we learn the things that we need to learn about God's character, about the purposes and plans that he would have for us, about what is right versus what is wrong. And if we will dig into it and study it, we will learn better. We will learn better than what we even thought maybe we knew today because we couple Old Testament knowledge with New Testament knowledge in that way. There are several things that I think are kind of just kind of ancillary points to this. For, for one, the Old Testament writers claim to be inspired more than 3,800 times. You know, for those who want to dismiss it as to say, well, I, I don't know that that's really all that important or anything, well, think about how many times the Old Testament writers said something like, Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord said unto me, and the Lord told me to speak to you in these various ways. And it's said over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. And so again, it's not so much just what Jeremiah had to say, but to recognize that it is what God had to say through Jeremiah. It's not just what Moses had to say, but it's what God was saying through Moses. And so some 3,800 plus times in the Old Testament, those writers claim to be inspired. You know, so much emphasis as we've placed in the last couple of weeks is there upon the apostles and the fact that they were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ and that they were the apostles, the ones sent to go and bear witness to those things and teach those things as the apostles of Jesus. Well, again, what is the Old Testament? Well, it's commonly referred to as the law and the prophets. The law spoken by you know, that's interesting. So often we read it as if it's the law spoken by Moses. But is that really the truth? No, it was the law spoken by God. And so often we say, well, the prophet said. But was it really the prophet that said? No, it was that God said through the prophet Jeremiah, through the prophet Daniel, through the prophet, you know, go down the list. And so again, sometimes we just kind of get cart before the horse and we get it in reverse order and we focus on the author of it instead of recognizing the inspiration of it. And so the Old Testament is inspired of God the same as the New. And there's value there to understand and to hear it as the written word of God. Jesus claims that the Old Testament writings are from God. Hey, that's a huge deal too. If you want to dismiss uh, anything about the Old Testament, then think about what Jesus had to say. Let's look at these verses together. In Matthew chapter 5, in this context, Jesus is preaching his Sermon on the Mount, if you will, as we talk about it so often. And in chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom 
of heaven. And then he begins this antithesis argument in which he says, you have heard that it was said, the scribes and Pharisees said, don't murder. And he says, but I say to you, whoever's angry with his brother. And and in essence, I, I've pictured this as, as if you see two different crowds here while Jesus is preaching and teaching. On one side, you have these scribes and Pharisees who are the naysayers that are over there, linked arms and you know really against Jesus. And on the other side, you have the the sinners, the, the disciples that had come to follow him, the tax collectors, the heathens to everybody else that were very interested in all this because Jesus was teaching in a very different way than what those guys did. And you can almost see the picture of Jesus looking back and forth between these two where he would look over at these that are the disciples that are following him and say, you have heard that it was said by these guys, <laughs> you know, you shall not murder, but I say to you, these guys hate each other. And murder begins at the heart. And obviously I'm ad-libbing, but if you just carried that out in a normal human conversation, it's in essence Jesus telling them they hate each other so much. You watch one day, one of them will kill one of them. And yet from their very lips they have said, you shall not murder. And in that same context, as you go down, he talks again, as I mentioned a while ago, about adultery. They've said, don't commit adultery. Don't do it. And they're lusting after each other's wives. There's a history in that culture of kind of doing a wife swap kind of thing where they would put away a wife, not officially divorce her according to Moses' law, just put her away. Why'd they do that? They didn't really like her, but one of their buddies over here did. And that man would take her as his wife. And it was all kind of hush-hush, you know, because the women didn't have any rights anyway. Well, what does Jesus later on say about that? Well, it's a little complicated, and I don't want to get too much into it here, but Jesus condemns that kind of lax approach to putting away and divorcing. And he really, in essence, he ultimately calls them out as all being adulterers. Because of that. It's the same thing here as the looking at a woman to lust. Adultery begins in the heart. Now what I want you to see about that is that Jesus, as he teaches this here, is there any such thing as the New Testament in this moment? No. No, in this moment when he originally taught this, not when it was written. Now by the time Matthew writes this, it's, it's years later. And so... You got to kind of understand that. But when Jesus was originally teaching these things, there's no new covenant. No, what's he doing? When he says, I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill, well, yeah, he's going to fulfill the prophecies himself. But when he teaches about the scriptures, what is he teaching? Friends, he's teaching the Old Testament, and he's teaching it in its fullness. That's what he's doing. He, why do you not commit adultery? Not just so you don't do the deed, but so your mind doesn't go to those places. Why do you not murder? Well, you don't, mur you, you don't just not murder, but you don't walk around with that kind of hatred inside your heart for your brother. I mean, it's just, he's teaching the fullness of the whole thing, not just the letter of it. In Luke 24, similar example, but in Luke chapter 24, in verse 44, Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now here's another one that's interesting. He not only says the law and the prophets. You know, there's some people who have kind of cast out the Psalms. But in this context, he includes the Psalms. As they say, look, it's the law, the prophets, the Psalms, which is, in essence, everything that spoke concerning him. And they were fulfilled in him. Well, another thing to consider is that the New Testament writers claim that the Old Testament is from God and that it's valuable. Look over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
Now, this one might be a kind of a shocker to you. I want to look at verse 15 first, but we'll flow into verse 16. Remember in verse 14, Paul writing to Timothy, he says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood, notice verse 15, that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, again, I would raise the question, what's the Holy Scriptures? It's everything written by inspired writers. The entirety of the Word of God. Genesis to Malachi. At this time, I don't know exactly what all for sure would have been written and being passed around, but let's just assume for a moment that at least some of the gospel accounts had been written and were being shared around in a written form. That's scripture. I'm sure Paul would have been including that too. But, you know, I have less confidence that Paul is really talking about the gospel accounts than I would have the confidence that Paul is talking about the Old Testament scriptures as we talk about it. And that from childhood, Timothy had been taught the scriptures. Now, was Paul telling Timothy that that wasn't valuable? No, he's telling him it is valuable. You know, it's a lot harder to sing the Old Testament up here with these kids. Have y'all noticed that? It's easier to sing the New Testament song. But you know what? I think there's also a, a, a kind of scary reality in that. Sometimes it's... It's easier to teach the New Testament than it is to also teach the Old Testament. And we need to be careful of that. Although I would say with our younger generations, often it's, it's, it's quite conducive to teach the Old Testament because you have some great characters that you can talk about and lessons that can be learned from them. But let's never give up on that, even as adults, in learning the examples of the Old Testament. Because here Paul tells Timothy, those are the things that from your childhood, made you wise for salvation. Now, notice in verse 16, we quote this often. But I'm going to tell you, most of the time when we quote it, we're not thinking about the Old Testament. We're thinking about the New Testament. And I'm not saying it's wrong to think about the New Testament. But when Paul said this to Timothy, what was he really talking about? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, what was he really talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. Definitely was talking about that. It's a little harder to know exactly what else was written by this time when Paul writes to Timothy. But what, what, what Paul ultimately had to really have a grip on what everything is and how it happened. I mean, bottom line is, no, they don't. They have theories. Watch that. Okay, because when you look at what scientists say, it's all theories. They can't prove beyond any shadow of a doubt exactly what happened. Well, all that aside for a minute, if we believe that one verse of the Bible is the word of God, then let's believe the whole thing. Because Genesis claims it's inspiration just like all the rest of the scripture. And in the book of Genesis, we have the history. The history of how it all came to be. And the explaining of the origins of all things, and I would submit to you, makes a lot more sense than what some of the man-made theories are even today. In Genesis 3, we read about the fall of man, and that's important. Why does all this matter? You know, we've been asking these great questions on Sunday afternoons that so many people frequently ask. Why does it all matter? Why does it matter that I believe in God? Why does it matter that I'm worried about a heaven and a hell or what happens when this life is over? Why does it matter if I understand what the Scriptures say? Old Testament or New Testament? Why does it matter? Well, in Genesis 3, we really begin to learn why it matters. Because that's where the fall of man fully takes place. And what we see is that in Adam and Eve's sinning, God had to place separation. And it set forth and into motion God's redemption plan of mankind. The definition of sin itself. What is sin? You know, we could talk about it in the New Testament, but I would submit to you, you really can't talk about sin in the New Testament without quoting things that were long said before in the Old Testament. Sin is defined for us in the commandments of God, the statutes of God, the principles of God, the righteousness of God, and the unrighteousness that He revealed in His Word in the Old Testament. That's how we know what sin is. 
man's need for a savior. Again, the point of all this, when you understand that God has said there's something called sin, that you have fallen, that you are separated from me, then we understand, well, what's the answer to that? How do we, how do we make a, a, an effort to get back in the presence of God and right with God? Well, again, where do we learn about that? We don't learn about that just in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, when the New Testament is teaching us about the need of that, the New Testament is talking ultimately about Old Testament things. Take note sometime when you read through the Gospel of Matthew how many times he quotes the Old Testament. Take note sometime when you're reading the letters of the Apostle Paul how many times he quotes the Old Testament. If you have a a Bible with a center column reference, you can just look verse by verse down through there and as you look at the references, the references are largely Old Testament references. Because what they were doing is they were teaching Jesus through the Old Testament. They were teaching about the church through the Old Testament. They were teaching about salvation through the Old Testament. They were teaching about forgiveness and sin and redemption and reconciliation. All of those things. They were teaching about it through the Old Testament scriptures. We learned about the nature and the character of God. When we look at God's law and God's people, God's judgment with his people, the punishment that was exacted on his people, the rewards that he gave to his people, all of those things as they play out through the Old Testament scriptures, they reveal God's nature and his character and ultimately God's love. You know, we have a hard time today because we have misconstrued in our thinking what love is because we try to define love. Let me ask you sometime to, to really sit down and think about it as what your definition of love is and, and, and ask where the source of it is. The, the source of your definition of love is very important. If the source of your definition of love is by everything that you've experienced in this world around you, then it will be a discombobulated definition of love. But if the source of your definition of love is God, then that will be the, the right kind of love, I would submit. But it will also be a complete kind of love. Because as the Bible teaches us about love and teaches us about God's love, it reveals the, the tough side of love too. The need for discipline and correction and learning the hard lessons. The need for changes and separations and the need for growth and improvement and the need for great levels of perseverance and endurance, patience. The great levels of sacrifice that will be made when true love is really, really being enacted. And finally on this, we can see that in the Old Testament we have examples and warnings and principles that are all right there for us to learn from and, and not only for us to learn from, but for us to better understand what the New Testament is even asking of us. In Romans chapter 15, as Paul writes to the church at Rome in verse 4, says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It's written for our learning to help us through these examples and warnings and principles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is a really interesting uh, set of verses and, and, a, and a dissertation given by Paul concerning the Old Testament and what happened there. But I want you to notice, uh, Just I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read the first few verses. Notice what he says right at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 10. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Whoa! Paul dropping down some new information there in a sense, right? Paul just put Christ in the Old Testament. You see that? But you see, as he goes on and, and talks about that, he, he, he gives it 
the, the meaning that it needs to have for each of us, and that is we learn through all of those examples. Hey, God was there in the Old Testament. Jesus was there in the Old Testament. In verse 11, he says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Hey, they were tempted in the Old Testament too, weren't they? But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul invokes the Old Testament to show us Christ in the Old Testament, to show us God in the Old Testament, and to show us that that admonishes and teaches us even today. They were tempted just like us, and we can learn from it. They were rewarded, as we will be, and we can learn from it. Hey, they were punished, as we better be ready to be, and we need to learn from it. Well, look with me to Galatians 5. I want to read just a couple of other verses, and I'll close. In Galatians 5, in the first few verses, Paul writes, Stand fast, therefore. In the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. I want to say a couple of things about this. It's one thing to say that the old law is important and that we learn from it and that it's God's word. It's another thing to try to bind the old law uh, today in the same way that it was to be bound on the Israelites. I have spent almost no time talking about that in the lesson today, but that is a very important uh, kind of line that needs to be drawn on the chart. When Christ died and rose from the dead and sent his apostles and established the church that we've been talking about, there was a new covenant that was then put in place. And the scriptures talk about this in great detail. As a matter of fact, you could read the book of Hebrews with that one thought in mind that there is a new covenant. What do I need to know about it? And the Hebrew writer tells you a whole lot about it, about how the old was done away and now the new is in place. How the old was good, but the new is better. And he goes all the way through that process. But here's what I want you to see in what Paul said to the the Galatian brethren there. When we try to justify ourselves by the law, he says, you have fallen from grace. Now, let that sink in for a minute. You know, I think one of the great points to take from Jesus' teaching and the Sermon on the Mount and his little moments of sermons and dissertations that he gave to people is that if you really look closely, you know what you're going to realize is that anybody listening to Jesus would have had to have walked away from there convicted of their own shortcoming. And what many had done with the old law, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, is they had tried to take that old law and check those boxes. And just like that Rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He thought he'd checked all the boxes, you know. Well, you walk away somehow from Jesus' teaching, and, and instead of realizing, I've checked all the boxes, and I have done this, and I have saved myself, and I have gained heaven, somehow you walk away from Jesus saying, thank you, Jesus, because I'm a sinner. And so when we seek to be justified by the law, we've fallen from grace. What's grace? Grace is that unmerited favor, the gift from God. Hey, what's a gift from God? The very breath we're taking right now is a gift from God. Could God rain down down fire from heaven and say, this is it right now, right here today? Absolutely. By the same word in which he did everything else he's done, he could call that word right now and say, this is it. Every moment we have is a gift from God. Don't fall from grace. See the value of the Old Testament. Learn from its lessons. Learn from its examples. Dig into its scriptures because it's all breathed of God. But thank God for Jesus every day. 
Because ultimately we're told that by the works of the law, no man would be saved. Why? Is it because the law wasn't good enough? No, it's because man wasn't good enough. And man will never be. Thus, by grace, we've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Does that mean that we sit on our hands and we do nothing? God, help us not to. (laughs) That would be a horrible response to what God has done for us, wouldn't it? No, instead, we're told what to do, aren't we? We've looked at these throughout all of this. The Great Commission was there, and Jesus told his disciples. He said, look, I've done it all. Y'all don't have to do anything. Is that what Jesus said? No, he said, go therefore, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you, teaching them to observe it because they're going to check all the boxes and be saved through the law. No. No, because it's good. Teach what Jesus taught because it's good. And we'll be better if we live by it. What else did he say to them? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. You want to be saved? Well, let's do what Jesus said. What did they say on the day of Pentecost to the whole crowd that was there? They crucified him. Hey, you think you've done something bad? You think you've done something bad? Did you shout crucify him? I mean, you know, we could argue that, well, even though you and I didn't literally shout crucify him on that day, By our sins, we've essentially done the same. But, you know, sometimes we're really hard on ourselves as if we have done so much bad that we can't come to God. Really? The people who literally shouted crucify him on this day said, well, what do we do? It's pretty simple, wasn't it? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. Why? Just because that's what God said do? For the forgiveness of your sins. You want to feel clean? You want to feel forgiven? You want to feel hope? This is what you do right here. And you know what? This is the message that needs to go to everybody. We've talked about this some too. But what did Jesus say when he looked out over that crowd and he saw all those people weary and scattered like sheep that had no shepherd? And he said, pray. Pray. Today, if you're a a good, honest, faithful child of God, I hope you are, and that's wonderful. But I want to tell you something you can keep doing every day is pray. Pray that more and more people will see Jesus, as God has revealed him, and will give their life in the way that Jesus has asked. That's what we need to do. Old Testament is very valuable today. But it's valuable because it's from God. And the best thing that God ever sent to us was his son. And we need to see it all through his son. If we do that, I think we'll be on the right path. There's something we can do to help you today. We'd love to do that. We're going to stand and sing a song. If you need to confess sin in your life, scriptures tell us to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another. We'll do that with you today. If you're not a Christian, won't you become one? It's no different message than what was told to those from the very beginning. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I believe that's very true today. If you want to be baptized into Christ, then you can have hope of salvation right here today. Whatever your need might be, we'd ask you to come while we stand and sing.